Um, I thought I could approach my 10 minutes with um, a little bit of a personal history, actually, which seems to speak to many of the questions that's asked in um, Jules's paper. Um, it starts really with me from uh, quite a young age when my mates were all going drinking and I was a bit more interested in what was, it was called cute community activism in those days and getting angry about things. And uh, subsequently, um, after several years, uh, as a mature student, I did uh, a degree in informal and community education. Could you imagine such a thing? A degree in informal <laughs> education. But, but no, there is one in fact, just down the road in the uh, um, Custom House area. Um, it was a good job, um, I was that course, because um, there were no qualifications necessary, <laughs> which is a bit different from as it was now. In fact, they only asked me one question. Um, and that was, tell us about your community activism, which I had quite a lot to answer to, but uh, had I needed a pile of air levels, I wouldn't have got in, so uh, things change. So, informal community education um, is a kind of a concept that sits in the wings in the wider discourse about education, but occasionally it jumps out again, and uh, these concepts of informal learning that are addressed in your paper um, have been alive and well for many, many years, of course. And, uh, some of us have been working on these for uh, a good while. Um, I, I came, come recently from the ICSI conference in Cadiz in Spain, where probably 1,500 academics were moaning about neoliberalism and the effect on them and how the ref was more important than anything. And uh, somebody suggested that everybody should have to read um, Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. If that was the first book that everybody read, think would be okay. And, and actually, I pointed out that for com informal community education, it is the first book that we have to read, you know, and has been for decades and decades and decades. Um, so I had a picture of uh, Paolo's book. Um, I also had a picture of a book called Living Adult Education, which is an account of an attempt to use various ideas in Britain. And that's a wonderful, wonderful book. And I worked for that project in Edinburgh, Gorgie Dalai in Edinburgh as somebody who um, really wanted to know whether or not you could just read, you know, the distinction between <coughs> reading freely and thinking, well, you know, this sounds pretty good, and whether or not you could actually do something on the basis of Freire's ideas. And uh, it seems to me a lot of people read Freire, that that's what they did, they just read it, you know. And there were a few who said, let's have a crack, but the guys in uh, Edinburgh have been using, using Freire's ideas in a few work practice for more than 40 years, and it's uh, an extraordinary project that goes on. So there's kind of a sense of experimentalism in all of that. And I went back from there to work, um, as I've done largely in my career, with older young people, young adults, many of them um, who have got many interesting labels these days, from the disaffected and the disenfranchised, and not specifically young offenders, and certainly it's not true that the project in um, York was tied with the Young Offenders, it was very much a community project. But these guys were so concerned about how they'd been manipulated in the education system that um, I needed a kind of a methodology that would engage them in the first place. And I had a friend who was a journalist, there's a few here it seems, who used to give me the big piles of photographs that the photographers of the local newspaper took. And, uh, in order to get uh, a sense that I wasn't trying to manipulate their learning, I would put many of these photographs out on a big table, often 20, 30 at a time, and I'd invite any one of them to pick one of these photographs. And um, I remember well that the first one that was picked was a picture of two young chaps, probably only about 10, boxing. And uh, this was to uh, deliberately not pick a thing to deliberately not pick a thing, which seems to be something that happens very much in philosophy of the pubs. I doubt that you could get too many people in if you didn't have a theme. But these were young people. Every time a theme was suggested to them, it was just another story about the manipulation of their education. So I said, pick your picture and pick your question, you know, and I'll help you to discuss it. And that stuff created a kind of a learning environment that I introduced teachers to and they marvelled at the capacity of these young people who had all been thrown out of school to learn. So it went with me for a long time, did that. Um, as a community worker, 
somebody schooled in the ways of community development as well. Um, it wasn't just that that was important to me, it was the sense that we could do something on the basis of our deliberations. Actively do something, social action. So a lot of these projects were designed, these initial conversations and dialogues were designed to inform the kind of actions that we ought to take. Um, I wrote um, a paper about this way back in 1994. It was called Freire for Young Adults, and this was based on this stuff that I'd made up, you know, these methodologies that I'd tried to abstract from Freire's ideas, uh, which subsequently I found out there was all sorts of wonderful people having a go, not least the people in Sapiri. So I had a good hard look at um, philosophy for children also. I must admit, I, got, I mean, I did all the training courses as well, but I did get a bit freaked when every time the kids I was working with in school came to interesting conclusions, often about their schooling, and then the door used to get slammed and they had to go back to their uh, curriculum. So I'm never entirely sure that the institution of the school was particularly amenable to the social action that might come out of philosophical inquiry. Um, and equally, there is great ideas about problematisation. In, in uh, informal education, we talk about the need to examine the taken for granted. That seems to be particularly important for the work I was doing. So, then I come now to, the, uh, to my relationship with the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. I've done an awful lot of work about antisocial behaviour. Uh, you go to other countries, they don't even know what it bloody means, so there's something interesting about that. And I'd said all along that if you look at the interventions that policymakers have dreamed up to um, tackle antisocial behaviour, curfews, dispersal orders, cameras, yeah, it goes on and on and on. Yeah, they were all forms of antisocial intervention. They stopped people being social. And I said to the, I would track down my Joseph Ramsey Foundation because I was saying you need to do the opposite. You need something pro-social. You can't tackle antisocial behaviour with antisocial interventions. You need pro-social interventions. And I, and I went to an estate in York that was, you know, this kind of, hellhole of antisocial behaviour and they'd thrown extra police officers at it, they'd done this, they'd filled the place full of people and it all got bloody worse of course. So little romantic me went there and I said I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll get these people talking to each other and I'll use some interesting methodology to do that and uh, I've long since been concerned, I mean you don't find too many informal community educators anymore, they've been killed off because they all have to do particular issue-based work now. But this was a chance for me to resurrect this great tradition of working without any sense of what was going to happen, what I call democratic practice, actually. So community conversations, especially between groups who were different, often in the social environment of philosophy for pubs or whatever, my sense is that there's a kind of a sameness amongst people, certainly the sameness in terms of their interest in these kinds of activities. But I very deliberately set about bringing young people and police officers together in philosophical inquiry, bringing young people and older residents who were terrified of the youth together. Anybody who was different, put them in the same place. I started off using some really strong images that invoked in many thoughts of antisocial behaviour. And when I had my first public meeting about antisocial behaviour, they were queuing down the bloody road, 200 of them, right? Because, of course, they all want to go and bite somebody's head off. <laughs> when they had to go in there and do some philosophical inquiry, when they were asked, what is antisocial behaviour, concept analysis, things started happening, and those communities used time and time again philosophical inquiry to think about the things that could be done the things that were at the heart of the reasons why these problems were existing. So we had a whole series of action projects, um, these inquiries between young people and police officers. One of the action points that arose from that was a contract between young people and police officers. They wouldn't swear at each other. And I can't, it's extraordinary how effective that was because it slowed down the conversations, it stopped them turning mental. And, uh, we, we campaigned for leisure resources. These were seen to be the real foundation issues. 
we campaigned to get rid of the very dispersal order that that community had campaigned for on the basis of the conclusions that it was the last thing that that community needed. So of course, interestingly, we got some very hard outcomes. It became a place where people wanted to live. We had games nights between young people and, uh, and the elderly where they introduced themselves to other things. So the kind of conclusions that were drawn initiated these forms of social action. So um, I want to make a move now to talking uh, very profoundly about why I think process matters. And I've been saying this all my life. I did find a wonderful quote in The Guardian. Uh, it's only, in fact, it's just a week ago, 11th of October. A cabinet office spokesperson, this was the, uh, many, if you're public servants, you will have read that, revealed plan to make civil servants work longer hours. And, uh, and of course, take all their you know, terms and conditions off them as well. A cabinet office spokesman said that the civil service was being reformed to make it faster, more unified, focused on outcomes, not processes, and ultimately more enjoyable to work for. I thought, yeah, that'd be right. And, um, you know, the point being, process matters. And I like this kind of stuff because it is a very deliberate commitment to process, to democratic process. So I challenge the question, uh, what role are community philosophy and philosophy groups playing, and could they play in education and wellbeing policy? I prefer a slightly different uh, question, and it goes like this. What role are community philosophy and philosophy groups playing, and could they play in education and wellbeing? I just leave the policy bit off the bloody end, do you know what I mean? Because as soon as we put the policy bit on the end, all the kind of activities that we're talking about, we know what, excuse me, I'm swear then, we know what will happen, they'll be used as mechanisms for fixing bloody problems. People come to me on a daily basis, can you fix this? Can you fix teenage pregnancy, drug abuse, all that kind of crap? And the way to fix stuff is to get on with good social, you know, social activities. I've been writing some stuff about the death of community work, yeah, what would, that's why I fear the kind of psychologisation of this and I look forward to the debate with people who come from psychology backgrounds, as I see this in practice as a form of pathologising social problems and the community bit speaks to the moral, it speaks to the ethical, it speaks to the political and it speaks to the democratic, so I want to big up the word community. So I'll finish with a couple of other comments about this stuff in practice. I've been working with gang members involved in street violence, not just from this country, um, young people in London, young people in Bradford, um, but also in Germany and Austria. And I've been using, a lot of people said I shouldn't do it, but I've been using some images to get some discussion going about violence. First, you've got to let people say what they think violence is. I've done a lot of work with young people involved in fascist activity, and don't just start by saying it's all wrong, ask them what they think it is, you know, concept analysis first, that's all that philosophers do as far as I'm concerned, work out what the bloody words mean, and then work out what we should do. So I showed them that image that was in the paper about the young Tibetan guy who talks to himself, now that's pretty full on that image, and these young people concluded that it was possible to inflict violence on yourself. I, I could see Bourdieu in the corner, actually. But um, they all, they said to me, violence is when two people are fighting. And they developed a sense through their inquiry that violence could exist in many forms. And I've read Buddy Bourdieu, and some of the stuff that I see in the communities I work in, I call that structural violence, just like, um, just like Bourdieu did. So I think that, um, I want, unashamedly, I want to say that some of this stuff has a capacity to unpack social reality, to, you know, to raise consciousness about those realities, to give people the freedom to interpret the world as they see it, especially in conversation with others, and to inform their social action. So my parting shot is about, perhaps there's something very interesting here about these processes as a form of reflection, but also as a form of research. And um, for those academic philosophers um, and any other kind of ac academic people who, of course, are involved in research, I think this represents a very interesting provocation about the uh, supposed status of uh, external 
evaluation as if it's somehow, somehow um, more objective. There is a very important paper from a, a Belgian uh, philosopher called Blero, um who talks about this sort of dichotomy of internal evaluation and external evaluation. And I see, and I'm trying to work now on the idea that philosophical inquiry becomes a way of trusting communities to, to, to reflect and to evaluate and to research their own realities in order to inform the things that they're going to do. It's, and it's likewise, it represents a bit of a challenge to contemporary um, attitudes to the professional as well. So I, I think we're into some really interesting territory in that part now about the kind of orthodox ways of seeing the world. But for me, there has to be uncertainty in this project. That's what my own academic research is about. The absolute essential nature of the respect and the celebration of uncertainty because we can't have democratic practice, we can't have democratic learning, and I don't think we can have a good society unless we respect uncertainty. And the systems that we've got now, they seem to destroy any sense of it. We're working from a, you know, we're working to achieve something that's prescribed. I always write pre, hyphen, scribe, to, to remind me that it's already written, and that's not the tradition of informal community education, and I don't think it's the tradition of Thank you, Graham.